Well, one week of the NFL playoffs is done, and now we're moving on to week number two, the divisional round of the 2020-2021 NFL season playoffs. You are listening to the Chips Podcast. Tyler Melito, joined by my good friend and yours, Ryan Amick. Ryan, fun fact, our Wild Card Weekend preview got 151 views on YouTube. I don't know why people want to listen to two knuckleheads like us, but you know what? I greatly appreciate it. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, and I mean – the name lived up to itself. It was called Super Wild Card Weekend for a reason. It really was pretty wild. I mean, for the first time, obviously, there were six games played during the Wild Card Weekend. And for the most part, mo- most of the games went as expected. But there were some games that kind of threw a wrench into some plans, especially a certain night game that we'll get to later on. But, yeah, it was great content. I, I hope about. people start listening to us because, I mean, I personally, when I go back to watch these, I cringe a little bit at my own voice. But hopefully it's not as bad to other people watching and yeah, we get the numbers up as the season goes on, but a very exciting time in the NFL season. Of course, the playoffs, best time of the year. So a lot of people interested and hopefully we could have a great show talking about the divisional round, which should be just as good, if not better than Wild Card Weekend was. Definitely better, I think, in terms of quality of teams. We got the now two number one seeds back into it. The Green Bay Packers and the Kansas City Chiefs will preview those games. Honestly, I'm top of the board. Four really exciting matchups in terms of storylines, players, the, t- the teams involved. It should be a great weekend. But let's start with the first game of the weekend on Fox Saturday at 4.30 p.m. You have the Los Angeles Rams who upset the Seattle Seahawks in the first round, taking on the number one seed in the NFC Green Bay Packers at Lambeau Field. And looking at the game last week against Seattle, Honestly, it was not a great performance by the Seahawks. They definitely lost that game. It wasn't like the Rams rose to the occasion. It was 30 to 20 LA and their defense really carried this one. John Walford started for the Rams, then got hurt, got a stinger. He's most likely out against the Packers this week. Jared Goff came in, did not really look like himself. Let's be completely honest there. And I, I know you could say Tyler, they scored 30 points but it really was not a Jared Goff game that we really expected. The touchdowns were for LA, a 42 yard interception return for a touchdown cam Akers run. And then a one passing touchdown from Goff to Robert Woods. Uh, it really was not much there from the passing game perspective. It was really the defense and the running game that really carried them in that win against Seattle. Ryan, what's your assessment of this Rams team last week against the Seahawks? And then what are your prospects for them this week against Green Bay? Yeah, so absolutely watching the game, defense and running game were the reasons they won. Jared Goff is pretty much the last reason why they were successful. It was not because of him. It was because of what you mentioned, the defense, which got to Russell Wilson early and often, got five sacks on him, including Leonard Floyd getting two sacks, and Aaron Donald, who did get a little nicked up in this game. It sounds like he's going to be ready to play against the Packers this weekend, but we don't know how healthy he'll be. But nonetheless, in, uh, in their game against the Seahawks, they got to Russell Wilson. They made him uncomfortable. He only completed 11 of 27 passes. He was always under pressure. And that pick, which you briefly mentioned on, that Darius Williams pick six was the game changer for the Rams in this one. Because we mentioned, we touched upon the defense in the running game, but the coaching, I think, is the main reason why the Rams have gotten to the point they have in the season, the main reason they even got to the playoffs. Because as we mentioned, Jared Goff in the quarterback situation has not been great the entire season. He's been very inconsistent. He's had turnover issues. He got injured a couple of weeks ago. And they were ready to not even play him, even though he looked like he was ready to play. And he ended up playing the whole game because of the John Wolford injury. But he didn't start this game because they did not believe in him. They were not confident in him. And it ended up being the right move. Unfortunately for them, they ended up having to play Jared Goff anyway because of the injury to John Wolford. But the coaching in this one made the difference. There's a reason why under uh, Sean McVay, they're 37-0 when leading at halftime. He knows how to get to his players. He knows how to coach this team, even when they have uh, downfalls at quarterback or other positions, dealing with injuries, what have you. Sean McVay finds a way to get it done. And I think with performances like this, he's earned his way into the top coaching tiers in this league. I mean, I'm talking Bill Belichick, Andy Reid, and then Sean McVay. He's up there with some of the greats with the performance he's put on. The fact that the Rams, who I didn't even think were going to make the playoffs, are now onto the divisional round is sensational. The fact that they went into Seattle to win a playoff game, which they – have have had struggles doing in recent uh, history. They have struggled in Seattle. They got it done against the uh, Seahawks. And that pick six was all Sean McVay needed. He just needed that one play to help set him over the edge, give him that halftime lead, and then they went the rest of the way with the win. And also 
Cam Akers, we touched about the running game. What a game it was for him as a rookie, getting 131 yards and a touchdown. He was a difference maker and uh, the main player on offense for the Rams in this game. And looking at the Seahawks, their main struggles were offense. I mean, their offensive coordinator, uh, Brian Schoenheimer, just got fired for a reason. He underperformed throughout the second half of the season, never mind just this playoff game. I mean, the Seattle offense was struggling big time. DK Metcalf was struggling big time, especially against the Rams. He did have two touchdowns in this game. One of them was a play where Russell Wilson, I mean, that was one of the best plays I've seen in a while. How 100% agree. Rolling to his left, throwing off his back foot, uh, back foot, two guys on him, pressured it, throwed a beautiful deep ball to DK Metcalf, who originally was running like a, like a little slant play on that play. The play was completely broken up, but Russell was like, go deep, deep gay, threw a perfect ball there. And that was right after he threw an interception. So that was a great way for Russell Wilson and Seahawks to respond but they couldn't get much offense aside from that play. That was essentially the really only big play they had all game. And then towards the end, DK Metcalf got another garbage time touchdown to make the score look a little nicer, but it didn't do much in terms of the game results because the game was pretty much put away at that point. But when we were previewing this game last week for our wild card video, we both kind of mentioned the team who doesn't turn the ball over in this game will win. The Seahawks turned the ball over twice, one Russell Wilson interception that got returned for a pick six. And then a punt return fumble, which the Rams then went on to score a touchdown. That was a Robert Woods play a couple of plays later. That pretty much ended the game there. So the two turnovers were key for the Rams in this one. Their defense, their coaching, their running game. That was the story, and that's what they got to have going into Lambeau, playing red-hot Aaron Rodgers, their leading MVP candidate, and one very, very bad man. One very bad man indeed. My pick to win the MVP, but we'll probably preview those in a couple of weeks. Who knows? Maybe, uh, depending on how things go. You touched on a lot there. Let's start with Sean McVay. I mean, I said at the beginning of the year, I did not think that – I think I, I thought everyone had figured him out, basically. And no one – that the Rams were not going to be able to succeed unless Sean McVay really changed how he ran the offense. And lo and behold, he has. This Rams offense has changed immensely from when he first took it over and took the league by storm. Uh, and I'm actually really cu- curious to see – if the Rams can get a legit quarterback in there, because I don't think Jared Goff is someone who can lead a franchise to a Super Bowl. He's sure he was a number one overall pick. He could throw the ball for miles and is a really talented player. But I just don't know if really he is the guy to lead a team. It will be interesting to see what uh, Sean McVay does in the coming years after this one. Uh, then you got Cam Akers, like you mentioned. 28 carries, 138 yards, and a touchdown. And he was coming off an injury. No one really knew what to expect from him. And I, I'll be honest, this rookie has really come on strong late in the season, been a huge boost for this Rams team in this offense, at least creating a little bit more of a balance. Because remember, toward the later stages of Todd Gurley's time in L.A., there really was not much of a running game. It was really pass, pass, and pass some more. Now it looks like the Rams have a future running back in Cam Akers, someone to I wouldn't necessarily necessarily say build around, but something they could rely on when the passing game just simply cannot get going. And then on the defensive end, Aaron Donald, if he plays and is, I'd say 75% of what he normally is, which is still really damn good, that would be a very impressive feat given the injury he suffered. He's got some uh, messed up cartilage in his ribs. I don't know exactly the terminology it is, but I know his cartilage in his rib area. That's going to be hurting. A lot, but Aaron Donald is a freak of nature. He will be a disruptor. Let's be real here. And he'll be on the Packers offensive line to just keep him away from Aaron Rodgers as much as possible. And then you got Jalen Ramsey. You mentioned DK Metcalf, the two touchdowns for 96 yards. And one of them, like you mentioned, came on that really fluky play. I wouldn't necessarily blame Ramsey for that, who was predominantly on DK Metcalf. Metcalf had five catches for the game on 11 targets. That is I'd say pretty darn good coverage by Jalen Ramsey. And now he's going to get an even bigger test against Rodgers, who is a much better quarterback, in my opinion, than Russell Wilson. And then against the top wide receiver in all football, at least for this year, in Devontae Adams. Adams, 15, 115 catches, 1,374 yards, and 18 touchdowns on the season in limited season play in all. And that could be a disaster if Adams can just get a little bit going, if he can start out a little hot, maybe get a touchdown early, who knows what this team could do. And overall, the fact that this game is played at Lambeau, that I think is key. If this was in LA, 
it'd be an even matchup. But the fact they're playing at Lambeau p- plays in the Packers' hands so much more, given they got the home field advantage. It's going to be cold. It's probably going to be a little wet. And I don't know if these Rams players have a lot of success. And then not to mention, I, bar- I almost forgot, Aaron Jones is still a really good running back. So if Devontae Adams can't get going, Aaron Jones certainly will as well. But it- it'll be very interesting to watch on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. I think what you touched on is very important. Aaron Rodgers playing at home in a playoff game with a bye. He's had a week off. Mm -hmm. That gives the Packers beyond a big advantage in this one. And I think the Rams, looking at this, they match up pretty well with the Packers. I mean, you talk about Aaron Donald. Sure, he got injured in the Seahawks game, but he looks like he's ready to go. And he's always a dominant player, no matter if he's fully healthy or not. The Packers, their O-line is going to have to contain him. They're out. Corey Lindsley, their all-pro center, and their left tackle, David Bakhtiari, who's also an all-pro. So that really hurts their offensive line, especially with Leonard Floyd and Aaron Donald getting two sacks against Russell Wilson. They look very hot right now. They have a good pass for us. And you look back at the Packers' loss to the Niners in the conference championship last year, a lot of it had to do with the Niners' pass rush, getting the Aaron Rodgers, making him uncomfortable. If the Rams can do that, they can have a shot in this game. Then you talk about the Jalen Ramsey. Jalen Ramsey, Devontae Adams matchup, arguably the best receiver and cornerback in the league. I'm so excited for this matchup. It could literally go either way. Devontae Adams is a touchdown machine. He might be limited in terms of yards in this game, but in the, in the red zone, I think he could have an advantage against Jalen Ramsey. And that's a huge part of the Packers offense, obviously. But even if they are to neutralize Devontae Adams, Aaron Rodgers just makes everyone on this team much better. MVS is a deep threat that Aaron Rodgers has gone to a lot more recently. Robert Tanyan is one of the leaders in touchdowns among tight ends this year. Aaron Jones in the backfield is a dominant rusher. I mean, there's so many pieces of this offense, even if they get pressure on Aaron Rodgers, even if they do lock up Devontae Adams somehow with Jalen Ramsey or if they end up double teaming them or what have you. I think the Packers just have too much going offensively. And the fact that it's Aaron Rodgers at home playing Jared Goff, who's still kind of injured and who only put up nine completions in their last playoff game. This is not the Seahawks. This is the Green Bay Packers. And I think that their offense mixed with their defense, which is also uh, very solid and has some playmakers like Jair Alexander, one of the best cover corners in the league. Mm-hmm. Zadarius Smith, one of the best pressures of the quarterback in the league. The Packers have so many playmakers on both sides. The Rams match up pretty well with the Packers. I think they'll make this a close game. But I think Aaron Rodgers is ultimately the difference maker. He's playing at an MVP level. He has a break. He's playing at on his home turf. I think the Packers win this one. But I think the Rams, uh, with their uh, defense, with Cam Akers, and with Sean McVay, can make this game a lot closer than most people would think. Yeah, definitely. And it comes down to a series of matchups. You got the two most young, two of the younger coaches in the NFL, and McVay on for the Rams, and Matt Lafleur for the Packers. That's one matchup. You got Aaron Rodgers versus that Packers or Rams defense. And let's be real. Rodgers does not make many mistakes, only five interceptions on the year. And a lot of those came earlier in this season. Uh, then you got Devontae Adams against Jalen Ramsey, Aaron Donald versus the Packers offensive line. It goes on and on and on. Ultimately, I think the Packers are going to win this one. But my one concern is for the Packers is if Devontae Adams does get relatively shut down against Jalen Ramsey, because I don't think you can entirely shut down Devontae Adams, given how good he is. But if he can get relatively shut down, whether it be maybe five catches for under 60 yards, basically similar to what DK Metcalf had last game, minus the 51-yard touchdown, given how fluke he was, because Adams is not the deep threat like Metcalf. I think the Rams will have a legitimate chance of winning, simply because the Packers' remaining receiving options – are not that great. Sure, you got Robert Tunyon, but let's be real, he's more so of a shorter field type player, red zone type guy, can get up and make a play in the red zone. Uh, You're not expecting him to go 40-yard streak down the middle of the field. Maybe he could, but who knows? Marquez Valdez-Scantling is the most inconsistent wide receiver outside of maybe the Bears guy who let that ball go through his hands. And uh, Alan Lazard has been a non-factor all season. So it'll be really interesting to see but let's move on, shall we, to the next game and the, the second game of our Saturday night doubleheader. We shift to the AFC, NBC, Bills at the Ravens. Both teams played last week. The Bills, we'll start with, they play at home against the Colts and was honestly a kind of an up and down game. They ultimately pulled out the victory 27 to 24, but there were times 
And I'm not just talking about the missed call with the fumble for Indianapolis with, uh, I believe it was Michael Pittman who fumbled the ball late in the game. But there were multiple times where Indianapolis looked like they could pull out the victory if they just didn't make one mistake or one thing went their way. Bills ultimately pull out the victory. Then you got on the other side, the Ravens getting revenge against Tennessee, winning 20 to 13, shutting down Derrick Henry. He only had 40 rushing yards for the entire game on 18 carries. The guy had 2,000 for the year, so I'd say pretty good there. Lamar Jackson, a ultimate monster, complete monster, 179 yards rushing, 136 yards passing, two total or one total touchdown, and then the Marcus Peters interception at the end of the game, icing it, and then the Ravens stomping on that Titans logo. My favorite moment of the entire game, to be completely honest. Ryan, I, where do you want to start with this one? Because you got two really talented teams here playing in Buffalo. And I don't know where to start, frankly, because that's that good. This will definitely be one of the most fun games to watch of the weekend, in my opinion. One of the most closely contested games of the weekend. And I want to start with the Bills because they did not look great in that win against the Colts. As you mentioned, there were multiple times where I think the Colts left points on the board. You go back to the first half. They were up 10-7, third and goal on their own on the one-yard line and they can't convert, then it's fourth and goal. They go for it, and ultimately it falls out of Michael Pittman's hands. It looks like he could have grabbed it, but it was incomplete. Turnover on downs. And then the Bills proceed to get a 95-yard drive and score a touchdown at the half to take the lead. I think that was the biggest mistake for the Colts in this one, especially because on that drive, there was a fourth down for the Bills where they were just looking to get the Colts to draw off sides, and if they didn't, they'd kick a field goal to tie the, tie the game at halftime. They got the Colts defender to bite. They continued to drive, and they scored a touchdown. And in that half, the Colts had so many opportunities to score. I mean, almost every drive for them started around their 35 to 40-yard line, while the Bills, almost, I think, every single drive started within their 15-yard line. There were so many chances for the Colts to convert and make, get more points than they did, especially with Michael Pittman was going off in that first half. He was pretty much unguardable in the first quarter. Jonathan Taylor had some of his biggest runs of the game in the first half, but they only could put up 10 points on the board. And in the Bills, who have never lost a playoff game when leading at halftime, they were able to close that game out. Even with that call that you mentioned with Jordan Poyer, it looked like he punched the ball out and it looked like a fumble. The refs reversed the call, gave the Colts another chance, but they were not able to convert. And the Bills kind of squeaked out with a home victory. Their first playoff victory in 26 years. It felt great for the Bills. They finally beat an AFC South opponent. As we mentioned in the last podcast, they lost to the Texans, the Jaguars, the um, the Titans in yep. the playoffs past. They finally got it over the Colts in this one. And they got to be feeling good about that game. But they have the Ravens come into town. And that's a very big issue for Buffalo Bills fans because Lamar Jackson is hot, hot right now. I mean, as you mentioned, Derrick Henry, 2,000-yard rusher, one of the best running backs in the league got absolutely shut down by the Ravens defense. They won the battle of the trenches by a mile. Meanwhile, Lamar Jackson got everything done on the ground, had that highlight play in the first half, broke out of the pocket for a 50 yard touchdown, which is really the difference maker for the Ravens in this one, especially because it was not looking good for the Ravens early on in that, in that game against the Titans. It was looking like a lot of deja vu, when Lamar Jackson threw that pick to Malcolm Butler, they found themselves in a 10 nothing hole already. It looked like, wow, is it going to happen again? But Lamar Jackson put the team on his back, fought all the demons from last year's playoff, because there's such a bad narrative about Lamar Jackson that he can't get it done in the playoffs. He played two playoff games before last Saturday. I mean, it was kind of ridiculous. The first time he was a rookie, didn't have a full season of playing and lost to a Chargers team that won 12 wins that year. So, you know, can't put too much blame on young Lamar Jackson in that situation. Really, the only time he couldn't get it done was last year against the Titans. But like Justin Fields, who got it done against Clemson, got the revenge in that situation. Lamar Jackson did the same exact thing for the Ravens. And they're coming into this game with all the momentum, in my opinion. And I think when it's all said and done, the Ravens will come out victorious in this game, heading to Buffalo, facing a MVP candidate like Josh Allen. I think if they are able to replicate what they did, did against the Titans and an MVP caliber player like Derrick Henry, if they're able to win the trenches, pass rush Josh Allen, make him uncomfortable. They have no run game already. They're out Zach Moss, the Bills are. So they're going to have to rely on Josh Allen, who was their leading rusher in the Colts game, who ran the ball for the majority of their snaps. 
uh, for the Bills. I think the Ravens can easily shut that down. They have Stephon Diggs, the Bills do, but the secondary, the Ravens can easily silence him and have him make him have a tough night. I think the Ravens defense is stronger than ever. Lamar Jackson is playing at his highest level since last year when he was an MVP candidate. J.K. Dobbins is getting it done for the running game as well, scoring a touchdown in seven straight games now. The Ravens, I think, are the second best team in the AFC. I think they get it done over the Bills, and I see them moving on to the championship game, completely silencing any narrative that Lamar Jackson can't get it done in the playoffs. Hey, can you stop taking all my points? I mean, come on, man. What kind of a friend are you? But seriously, though, I mean, the Bills, they had their chances, and then the Ravens were just utterly dominant against the Titans. That's the main storyline here. But the one thing I am looking at in this game, the Ravens, I think, are a lot more of a balanced team. Sure, Lamar Jackson is the leading rusher for the Ravens with over 1,000 yards rushing, seven touchdowns during the regular season. Obviously, the number one quarterback, so he's passing a lot too. But they got some other threats in with J.K. Dobbins, who came on late. Uh, Gus Edwards has played well as of late as well. The Bills, they don't have that. It's either Josh Allen throws the ball, slings it all over, or nothing happens. Josh Allen against the Colts, 324 passing yards and two touchdowns. He also is the team's leading rusher with 54 yards and a touchdown uh, in that game. So three total touchdowns for him. Devin Singletary might have the most rushing yards on this team for the year with 687, but he is a non-factor really, in my opinion, in terms of rushing the football and being a legitimate threat rushing the ball for the Buffalo Bills. It's really, if the Ravens could bottle up Josh Allen, it's all they got to worry about is the passing game. So from that standpoint, I give the edge to the Ravens, but at the same time, you got to look at it with, also, um, wow, I'm having a break for You got to look at the Bills are at home. They got that in their favor. They also have kind of a little bit of momentum given the, how close that game was at the end. And we saw how important the fans were in that game against Buffalo, at, uh, against the Indianapolis in Buffalo last week. There were only 7,000 fans there, but they were as loud as 70,000. We've seen it like in the Carrier Dome, how passionate Central New York fans are for their teams albeit they they are not very good all the time, but they are very passionate and loud and Bills have that on their side, which I think could be a huge factor. According to ESPN's Football Power Index, the Ravens have a 51.4% chance of winning to Buffalo's 48.6. That's how close this one is. The line, I believe, is set at two and a half in favor of Buffalo. It's very close on both ends. It's a real toss-up here, but I, similar to you, am going to go with the upset. I think the Ravens, just given how more balanced they are on offense with the passing and rushing ability on their team, and then the defense as well. I mean, the fact that Phillip Rivers is, I wouldn't say necessarily able to pick apart this Buffalo defense, but he looked good for the most part up until the fourth quarter outside of a couple plays. Lamar Jackson is going to tear up this Bills defense without question, in my opinion. And it's going to be very tough to stop him. Obviously, the Bills can do it. They have the talent, but I really don't know if they will actually be able to do it. The Ravens are just too good, and I think Lamar Jackson is also playing with a massive chip on his shoulder. But yeah, one, absolutely. one other thing, quickly. The fact that you got two really young players from the same draft class and Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson play in this game, the whole AFC quarterbacks are really young, but this game in particular, this is a matchup we are going to see for years and years to come. And I'm really excited. Yeah, I was just going to add one more thing. It's the Bills. It's going to be a lot of the same matchups as, as the Colts game was. And what I mean by that is the Colts pride themselves on pretty strong O-line, very strong run game, and solid defensive play. The Ravens almost have the same blueprint, but the, the one difference is quarterback. Instead of Phillip Rivers, they have a dynamic, sensation, MVP caliber player in Lamar Jackson. They have the run game that the Colts have, if not better. They have the defense that the Colts had, if not better. They are pretty much playing the Colts, but a better version of the Colts. And I think in this one, Lamar Jackson is the difference maker, like he was in the Titans game. And I think he's able to get it done. Over, as you mentioned, his fellow draft uh, uh, Mate. here yeah. uh, in Josh Allen, both of them winning playoff games for their franchise for the first time in their careers. They're going to have many more playoff wins for these teams in the future. This is a very exciting matchup, but I think we both agree the Ravens are the better team in this situation. 
Brian, before we move on to the next topic, next game, we got breaking news. James Harden James has Harden? been traded to the Brooklyn oh, Nets in a boy. monster deal. I'm the Nets? Here. Houston will acquire Karis LeVert, Dante Exum, Ronnie Kurogs, four first-round picks and four first-round pick swaps in a three-team deal, which also includes the Cleveland Cavaliers per Woj. The deal sends Harden yeah. to Brooklyn. He will be reunited with, obviously, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. And it doesn't look like – I don't know what the Cavs are getting, but this is a massive haul that Harden is going to Brooklyn for. So quickly before we move on, we'll talk about more of this later, I'm sure. Maybe we'll do a separate podcast just on this. But what are your initial thoughts? Well, I'm pretty glad that I predicted the Nets would go to the finals because, boy, does that look good (laughs) right now. Boy, does that look really good right now. Wow, what a big three in Brooklyn now. Mm -hmm. Kyrie – James Harden and Kevin Durant. That's absolutely crazy. And I mean, when, once you said four first round picks and four uh, pick swaps, I don't know if you saw, but my jaw literally dropped because yeah. that's going to be a lot of deja vu to when they made the Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett trades and gave away their whole future in that situation. But I think this is a better move for the Nets. They did lose Karis LeVert, who was a very good scorer off their bench, but they traded that in for James Harden, who is leaps and bounds a better version of Karis Lever. sure they're sacrificing a lot of their picks in the future but this big three is undeniable now in Brooklyn and I think that's a very smart move and I'm happy for James Harden as well because he clearly wanted to go to the Nets more than the Sixers or at least he gave hints that that was the case and also the Sixers were talking about giving Ben Simmons, Matisse Thibel, Tyrese Maxey all these players up for James Harden which I don't think would have been good for the Sixers in their future I'm glad that they were able to stay put with their dynamic duo, Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid. They're clicking right now. Just let them ride out, see what they can do in the playoffs while the Nets get a massive haul for James Harden. One of the more exciting big threes we'll probably see in the Eastern Conference and all of the NBA. And the Nets now are a real serious contender for the LA Lakers. I mean, you talk about the Lakers. They have the best duo in the league by far with James, uh, with Anthony Davis and LeBron James. But the big three now in Brooklyn is looking very good matchup wise with the Lakers. And I wouldn't be surprised if that move puts them over the top in the East and gets them a one-way ticket to a Lakers Nets finals. Sorry. I was like, we're Melito family household. It's we're ordering dinner and I take food very seriously, but I totally agree with what you're saying. This is a massive deal. So here's the full breakdown. It's a four team deal involving the Rockets, the Nets, the Pacers and the Cavaliers, the Rockets, well, the Nets are obviously getting James Harden. The Cavs are getting Jarrett Allen and Torrey Impress. The Cavaliers or the Pacers are getting Karis LeVert and a second round pick. And here are what the Rockets are getting. Victor Oladipo, Dante Exum, Rodney Kuros, three Brooklyn first rounders in 2022, 2024, 2026. When one Milwaukee first round pick that is unprotected in 2022 and four Brooklyn first round pick swaps in 21, 23, 25, and 27. A massive haul. You got the big three team up in Brooklyn. Now you got a big three somewhat, maybe big four somewhat in Houston with Oladipo, Wall, Cousins, and Christian Wood. And then obviously all the pe- draft picks. Obviously, uh, let's talk more about this another day. We'll break all this down. But a massive deal in the NBA. Moving on, though, to the next, the third game on our slate for the NFL's divisional round. You got the Cleveland Browns with the upset of the weekend against the Pittsburgh Steelers. They now go to the number one seeded. Kansas City Chiefs on CBS Sunday at 3.05. And frankly, it was a 48-37 to game. So you think, oh, close game, competitive all the way. Browns ultimately pulled it out. That was not the case. Ben Roethlisberger had four interceptions to four touchdowns in the game. Cleveland was up 28-0, to Ryan, and then was outscored 37-20 to in the final three quarters. I mean, this is why I don't give the Browns any chance. Sure, I doubted the Browns last week because of COVID, and they proved us all wrong. They proved the majority of people outside of Cleveland rock. But now I don't think they have much chance, not because of the COVID issues, but because they nearly lost a game that they had a 28 to zero point lead at the end of the first quarter. So that's just me, but I'll let you go off on this one. I don't know. I'm not as harsh on the Browns. I'm a lot more harsh on the Steelers because only thing I have to say, Corvette, Corvette, because that was literally (laughs) the whole focus of this entire season Beyond the 11-0 mark for the Steelers, mm-hmm. their whole downfall, winning, losing five of their last six games, and lo- ben, Big Ben 
losing for the first time at home against the Browns, never mind in a playoff game, never in a million years would I thought this was going to happen, given that the Browns were without their head coach going to this game, without one of their best uh, linemen in Joel Batonio, without a starter and a very good player in Denzel Ward in the secondary for the Browns. There is no reason the Browns should have been even competitive in this game. And that's no what we at both all. thought in our prediction last week. We, I mean, not to expose you, but you had the Steelers as the lock of the week. In, I did have the most lock of the week. This is why I don't bet ever. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, who would have thought that would have happened? And I, the whole flow of the game was determined off the first snap, which mm-hmm. went over ben, Big Ben's head, resulted in seven points for the Browns. Which it could, it could have been two points if Big Ben or James Conner just fell on the ball. It looked like they were playing hot potato with it. Like, no, you get it. No, you get it. The yeah. Browns players are like, I'll gladly take those seven points to start the game. That set the tone for the Browns. That had the Steelers out of sorts the entire first quarter, and that's a huge reason why the lead ballooned from seven zero to twenty eight nothing in the first quarter. The biggest margin in a first quarter in playoff history. And especially by a road team with the Browns coming in. But the Steelers on both sides of the ball look bad. I mean, obviously, offensively, they struggled. They turned the ball over five times. Big Ben threw four picks. He had 500 yards. All of them were garbage yards. None of them meant anything. Really they were in such a big hole at that point. But defensively, they looked even bad, too. I mean, Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb were running through their tackles like it was nothing. They looked like they were, had no effort. They were driving down the field so easily. The Browns controlled every part of this game from start to finish. Sure, they gave up a, a lot of points in the end, but they had such a big lead that I think they were just willing to run the ball, waste the clock, and just hold on to that lead because it was very hard for them to lose it at, at that point. But kudos to the Browns. They're getting all these players back. They're getting their coach back. And now they have the Chiefs. And this is kind of where the story ends for the Browns. It was yeah. a great run for them. Their first playoff win in 18 years. They finally look like an actual team with a bright future. They have their quarterback in Baker Mayfield. He's been playing great this year after a very questionable year last year. There was a lot of talk about maybe they should move on from him. He shut all that down this year with his dominant play. They have arguably the best backfield in football up there with the Ravens and Titans with Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb, just absolutely making guys look like fools on the football field. And their defense came up big, forced turnovers, put pressure on Big Ben. So they, they do have the players, they have talent, they have a lot of momentum coming off of this win, a division win where the Steelers had all the talk in the world saying they were the same old Browns, there'd be no challenge essentially. And then even after the Steelers lost, guys like Chase Claypool still talking about how they have no chance with the Chiefs and they aren't a great, great team. Steelers are all tough, they have their own issues. We can make a whole video about what they're gonna do this off season, all the free agents they have, what to do with Big Ben, even with the coaching staff, because Mike Tomlin, I mean, he might be on the hot seat at this point because his a little bit. has looked horrible, not just this year, but for a lot of years. Mm-hmm. Ever since the uh, Antonio Brown, Le'Veon Bell, Big Ben drama, they, uh, Le'Veon Bell and on- Antonio Brown are gone, and they still have the same issues with guys like Juju Smith-Schuster, even guys like Chase Claypool, still with Big Ben. There's issues in this locker room that need to be settled, and a lot of that has to be pointed to Mike Tomlin because you had your team at 11-0, and at one point and you just got dominated by an undermanned Browns team at home the first week of the playoffs horrible look for the Steelers the Browns have to be feeling themselves coming to this matchup but we're talking about the defending Super Bowl champions Patrick Mahomes Travis Kelsey Tyreek Hill you know the story Clyde Edwards Elair the Browns have a great offense the Chiefs have a much better offense that's the story in this one they they might have rested a little too much I wouldn't be surprised if they come out a little flat in the first quarter so maybe the Browns can jump on to another first quarter lead like they did with the Steelers but the difference in this one is we've seen Patrick Mahomes come back from 20 plus point deficits in divisional rounds to be specific as we saw just last year when they played the Texans so even if the Browns do go up big expect Patrick Mahomes carry this team and just get the job done against an inferior opponent in the Browns they have to be very happy because if the Steelers won this game they'd be playing the Ravens and this would be a whole different story for Kansas City I I think that could have been upset City if that happened but they got the Browns and I think we both will agree they'll be moving on to the AFC championship game 
that definitely could have been upset city and it would have been interesting to see what would have happened then uh you mentioned the one big point i was going to say the chiefs they patrick mahomes has had two weeks off basically same with tyreek hill travis kelsey clyde and Rizzo, all the main guys have basically had a week and a half to two weeks off for the most part in just terms of game play because some of them played week 17 a little bit you know uh, so I would not be surprised if the Browns come out and get a lead early. Maybe they're up 14 at the end of the first. Maybe Holmes looks a little sloppy, throws a pick, and the Browns have all the swagger. But then, like you mentioned, we saw it last year. We could see it again this year. This Chiefs offense could turn it on like this and make plays and leave the Browns in their dust or whoever they're playing in the dust. I will say, though, if Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt can get going, because this is also kind of a revenge game for Kareem Hunt, playing against the team that released him after his whole uh, scandal and whatnot that I really don't want to get into type thing happened. So if those two guys can get going. The Browns have a legitimate chance because they will carry this team. They can really control the clock, really take over the game. Despite sure Patrick Mahomes could score with one pass from 90 yard from 99 yards, if you really wanted to, but if the Browns can control the game as much as possible in terms of time possession, they, that is their way of winning. I, that's all I will say there, but it's going to be a, a really big uphill battle. But like you said, hats off to the Browns, given all the situation they had with COVID, the, the curses, the whatever you want to call it. The Browns have done something that no one would have thought they would have done, at least in, the re, in, the, in this era, maybe 10 years down the road, but who knows. Uh, moving on to the final game of the week. You got the third time these two teams have played up. In a Sunday night football game on Fox, 6.40 p.m., for some reason, they picked the weirdest times. You got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers visiting the New Orleans Saints. Brady and Bree. So week one, these two teams met up in New Orleans. Saints win 34-23. That was Brady's first game in New or- first game in Tampa Bay. It really wasn't a great showing. Well, talking about not great showings, you go to week nine. 38-3, the Saints win over the Buccaneers. It was awful, horrendous. Whatever word you want to describe it, the Buccaneers looked horrible. But now here we are in the playoffs. You got the Buccaneers with Tom Brady, with Marquise, uh, Marquise Goodwin, Chris Godwin, Antonio Brown, Mike Evans, Rob Gronkowski on offense alone. And then they got that stellar defense. Ronald Jones is a little hurt, so that's a little concerning. Against this Saints defense, who looked great against the Bears for the most part, I mean, I'm just excited. This is the game of the week for me. Third time's a charm maybe for Brady. And what might be the last game for Brady is that they lose. Not just that alone makes it intriguing, not to mention these two really talented teams. Yeah, this is by far the best game on paper, the most drama, the most hype. And there's a reason it's prime time, last game of the weekend. Mm -hmm. You have two 42-plus-year-old legends in Drew Brees and Tom Brady. Drew Brees is turning – Gives me hope. Friday. I can get into the NFL right now. Yeah. I mean, and this is the first time these two legends will face off in the postseason. Probably going to be the last time as well because there's a lot of saying that Drew Brees might retire after this season, and both of them only have a couple years max because, as we said, they're 42-plus-year-old players. But anyways, they're finally facing off in the playoffs for the first time. They both are surrounded by – unlimited weapons on offense and stellar defenses. You first look at the Bucs. They looked very good against Washington, especially first looking at the offensive line. They were able for the most part to contain that stellar defensive pass rush by Washington. Chase Young was held to only like one pressure on the game. He ended up suffering an injury as well. Really the only person on the entire Washington front who got any pressure was De'Aaron Payne up the middle. But the Bucs offensive line for the most part of the game gave Brady all the time in the world he needed. And with that time, he connected with Antonio Brown for a touchdown. He connected with Chris Godwin for a touchdown. He gave Mike Evans the ball a bunch. Rob Gronkowski didn't have a great game. It's all right because they had Cameron Bray who had a stellar game as well. I mean, there's so many weapons and they're so deep on offense. And now that Tom Brady and Antonio Brown are clicking, Antonio Brown looks like the player he was two years ago when he was arguably the best receiver in the league. And you still have Mike Evans, you still have Chris Godwin. You have a backfield where, yes, Ronald Jones is questionable in this game, but Leonard Floyd did, or Leonard, Leonard, Fournette. Fournette, Leonard Fournette did more than enough to take care of the ball. He's got almost 100 yards and a touchdown in their game against Washington. This Bucks offense is loaded defensively. Taylor Heineke 
lit them up. And boy, was that one of the stories of the weekend as well. I first want to talk about Taylor Heineke for a little bit because he might have himself a job in Washington after the performance he Maybe. did for Washington. 300 plus yards, getting it done on the ground as well. Two highlight plays from him were two of the best plays I saw all weekend. The first touchdown where he dove to the pylon, escaped the pocket and ran 20 yards to bring them closer in that game. And then a beautiful pass to the back end zone to Steven Sims in the fourth quarter, making it a one score game. Taylor Heineke did more than impress for Washington and hats off to him in his second career start to be playing Tom Brady in a playoff game and to not be, for lack of a better term, chitting himself because that's exactly what everyone else in this situation would have done because boy, is that one hell of a challenge to be facing in your second career start, but hats off to Taylor Heineke. He has a pretty bright future in the NFL after what he showed he could do in crunch time in a playoff game, but the Bucks were able to get it done, had a great defensive showing. They're getting Devin Bush back to add to their lethal pass rush. And I think this matchup goes very well in the favor of the Bucs, even though they are going to the Saints. They are playing on the road. The Saints did beat them in two regular season games already. And you do look, they do have Michael Thomas, Alvin Kamara, Andrew Brees on the, fir- on the field for the first time in seemingly all year, uh, aside from last, last week against the Bears. But the Saints did not look as good against the Bears as the Bucs did against Washington. Let's be real. The Bears had no business being in the playoffs. They scored three points for as far as I'm concerned. They got a garbage time touchdown with zero time on the clock to make it a nine point loss or to give them nine points in the loss. But they essentially could not score all game long. I think a part of that might have been uh, Javon Wims, who you touched on a little earlier. He might have got a little slime on his hands from the Nickelodeon uh, broadcast because that was in his hands. He dropped it. That was really the only scoring opportunity the Bears had all game. And they kind of just laid over to the Saints, who were clearly the better team. On paper, the Saints have one of the best rosters in the league. They have just as stout of an offensive line as the Bucs do. They have plenty of weapons on offense, as I touched upon. Alvin Kamara, Michael Thomas, Emmanuel Sanders, and, of course, Drew Brees. Even Jared Cook, if you want to add him in there as well. And their defense is solid. They have a very good pass rush, which is Tom Brady's kryptonite. It's going to be very interesting to see if the Bucs can hold up against the Saints pass rush like they did against Washington. They have a very good secondary as well. With all the weapons that Tom Brady has, they have the secondary that could give him trouble as well. But I just like in a matchup where both teams are pretty similar, it's just the Tom Brady's playoff resume is a lot better than Drew Brees' is. Drew Brees looks a lot more like the 40-year-old quarterback than Tom Brady is. Tom Brady threw for almost 400 yards and multiple touchdowns in their playoff game where Drew Brees didn't have the same type of stats. I think it comes down to Tom Brady versus Drew Brees in this one because they both have a bunch of talent around them. And Tom Brady all time has been the better quarterback. He's been playing better this year. He's healthier this year. He's been on fire as of late. The Bucs offense has looked unstoppable. I think this game's going to be close. It's going to be very good. It's going to live up to the hype. But I think the Bucs, I don't think they're going to lose to the Saints three times in one year. I think they get it done and they pull off the upset in uh, New Orleans. I mean, you, you hit on it all there. The one, one thing I also am really intrigued by, you mentioned the Saints pass rush, which is a Tom Brady kryptonite. Trey Hendrickson did not play last week against the Bears. They're a leading sack getter for, the, for New Orleans this, this season. He's questionable this week. I would not be surprised if he plays, so that could be a huge addition for them. But you mentioned it. Drew Brees did not look great against the Bears. He hasn't looked great all season. He's looking more so his age than Tom Brady is. And I think that could be the ultimate deciding factor in a game with two teams who are very talented on defense, have very talented offenses, and have two of the greatest quarterbacks, two great coaches, just top to bottom, really talented teams. And if Breeze does not have his A game and Brady does, that will be the deciding factor because sure, the defense could bottle up Brady, bottle up the run game, shut down AB and Godwin and Evans and whoever. But all it really will take is one play. One play for Brady to make that shifts the tide of the game, gives the Buccaneers momentum, and they will never look back. They haven't had that in the first two games. Clearly, they had three points in week nine against New Orleans. So, I think if Brady can get, just get that one play, use all the experience he has and just go out and play like we saw, we've saw, we seen him do for 20-plus years, there's no way the Buccaneers lose this game. If not, and maybe the Saints defense comes out a little bit more aggressive 
and maybe gets to Brady, gets in his head a little bit, shuts down some of their top guys. Then maybe we'll have a little bit of close game. New Orleans will have a chance. But if Brady can get going, I, I agree with you. The Buccaneers win this game. They go on to the NFC Championship. And what looks like it would be an Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, NFC Championship game. Ooh, buddy, that'd be really fun indeed. Uh, that closes out. The thing also, and when you look at – oh, sorry. I just want to add one more thing. Uh Funny thing, you look at the quarterbacks in both conferences. You have a lot of young bucks in the AFC wow. talking about Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen. Then you look at the NFC. It's Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, all these guys. 40, they're averaging, their ages are 40 plus Rogers, years what, old. Rodgers, what, 37, all towards the back end of their careers. Yeah, wow. Rodgers, the, the young gun, and he's almost 38 years old, aside from yeah. Jared Goff, but we assume he won't be playing beyond this week. But I think... Just going back to this game, one more point I wanted to add. I think the X factor for both teams is their run game. I agree. Look at the Saints, Alvin Kamara, arguably one of the best running backs in the league, the best dual threat running back in the league outside of maybe Christian McCaffrey. If the Bucs, who have one of the top rushing defenses in the league, can slow Alvin Kamara down, I don't think the Saints really have a chance. I think that's going to be one of the biggest matchups. Of course, Drew Brees, Tom Brady is the big one. It's going to be the title of this, the, the storyline for this game. But if the Bucks strong run defense can limit Alvin Kamara's production, if the Bucks, whether it's Ronald Jones or Leonard Fournette, can run on the Saints defense, I think the running backs in this game could be the designing factor. Whoever has a bigger game uh, at the running back position may or may not have the biggest impact on this game. But it sounds like we both are on the Bucks side. We're both envision a Packers Bucks. Uh, NFC Championship mm-hmm. and uh, Ravens Chiefs AFC Championship. Yeah, I that is exactly what I'm envisioning. Should be a lot of fun. One other point to branch off what you just said. Alva Kamara in the two games against Tampa Bay. Week one, 12 carries, 16 yards, and a touchdown, five catches for eight yards. Week uh, nine against the Buccaneers, nine carries, 40 yards, one touchdown, five catches, uh, uh, five catches for nine yards. Sorry. Week one, he had five catches for 51 yards. Week nine, he had five catches for nine yards. So if they can really bottle up Alvin Kamara, who is by far and away the best running back and receiver on this New Orleans team as it currently stands, sure, Michael Thomas maybe overall is the best receiver, but has not been this entire year. The Buccaneers have a legitimate chance. Alvin Kamara is the key for the Buccaneers, for the Saints. Tom Brady's the key for Tampa Bay. That's what I think on that one. Well, Close it out here under an hour. Once again, Ryan, high five on that one. (laughs) Not going crazy. You get to go to the gym early. Uh, Is there any other points you want to mention on this weekend? Any of the games that you want to say? Anything that you're looking out for overall? I think most of the games are going to be very competitive, just like last week as well. I mean, look at the Browns game. That wasn't exactly competitive because they had a 28-0 advantage to start the game. But most of the other games were all competitive, all pretty close games. I mean, you look at the first game, Packers-Rams. I think that, like we mentioned, the Rams match up good with the Packers. They could struggle early on. I think Aaron Rodgers ultimately does enough to get the win, but I don't think it's a blowout by any means. Ravens-Bills, I think, will by far be the closest game. It could go either way. We both are siding on the Ravens, but the Bills with Josh Allen, the way he's been playing. They got the talent. The way he dominated the Colts. He's got beyond enough talent to help the Bills win this game and make this close as well. The Browns and Chiefs, if the Chiefs are the Chiefs, this might not be as close as we may think, but the Browns have to make us question our doubts of them because we both doubted them against the Steelers and they put on a show. We obviously, people think the Chiefs are going to win this game, but that's exactly what the Browns want, exactly what the Browns are hoping for because they want to prove people wrong and they could definitely make this a competitive shootout. I think this is definitely take the over on this game. This is definitely going to be a shootout, two highly explosive offenses, and that should be very fun to watch in a close game as well. And then the Bucks and Saints, two divisional rivals, two legendary quarterbacks, two very good teams that match up well with one another in prime time in New Orleans. That should by far be one of the more entertaining games we see and that should also be a close one as well so i'm just really excited for some really competitive good football this week and i hope you are as well oh of course i am my my butt will be glued to the couch for most part this weekend uh thank you so much for listening to the chips podcast or watching or whatever you're doing we greatly appreciate it we want to continue to grow the brand so tell a friend or tell a friend 
about the show if you like it. That's all I'm going to say there. Enjoy football this weekend. And next time we talk, maybe it'll be about James Harden to the Nets. Maybe it'll be about Championship Sunday. We'll see. But Ryan, good talking to you, my friend. We'll see you next time.